I'll just take a few minutes and just consider um, Jesus in our presence here tonight. Lord, we're very thankful for the, the meal that you provided for us tonight. Thankful for the family that was able to prepare it for us. Um, we're just grateful in general that you give us all of the things that we need and more. We ask you to send St. Vincent de Paul, who we're going to speak about tonight, um, who lived in a time where a lot of people did not have all of what they needed for their bodily needs. There was a lot of poverty during that time. Um, <clears throat> but we're going to talk about how he dealt with that in a very positive way. So, Lord, thank you for the life of St. Vincent de Paul. Help us all learn at least one thing that we can incorporate into our everyday lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> so, St. Vincent de Paul. Um, a lot of you guys have heard the name St. Vincent de Paul for a lot of, a lot of good reasons. Um, you know, the St. Vincent de Paul Society, especially in this parish, does a lot of good works. And um, that's, that's a really good thing. And, but now, St. Vincent de Paul, we're going to learn a lot about the man. He actually did not found the society. He was one who inspired the society. <clears throat> and so uh, we'll learn about what it was about his life that inspired others to want to uh, create something in his name. So uh, Vincent, um, <clears throat> he, was, he was born in a peasant family. He was one of six kids. He was, I believe, the third oldest. And uh, there's a little town, I don't know how well you guys know your geography of France, but in southwest France, kind of near the border of Spain, kind of close to the Bay of Biscay, it's a little town called Puy, P-O-U-Y, so it's French, and I butcher it. Um, but it's near a bigger town called Dax, either place you've probably heard of before. Um, but this is the area where Vincent grew up. And he was a pretty smart kid. He was, you know, his brothers and sisters weren't quite as intelligent as he was, but for some reason his father sent him out to be the shepherd in the fields. And some of the neighbors came to him and said, what are you doing? You've got this kid who's really smart. And at this time, this is, he was born in uh, 1581, okay? <clears throat> so we, you know, it's one of those times we don't know a lot about. But, I mean, we as a society know a lot about it, but we typically don't know a lot about what's going on in 1581. <clears throat> but one of the ways that families could could get income is if they had an educated child, he could go off and make money and send it back to the family. So um, a lot of the other children, they weren't, they weren't as smart as, as Vincent was. And so um, the father, you know, kind of listened to them and said, okay, so which meant he needed to come up with some money in order to be able to do this. Because this is a time when um, not everybody got education. Um, you either had money and got education or you didn't have money and you didn't get education. There was really not a lot in between. But there were some families like his that were kind of in the in-between where they could scrape together some money just enough so he could, he could at least start school. Well, because he was, he was a pretty smart kid, by the time he was a little bit older, um, people were asking him to tutor their kids. And so this was, this was kind of a little bit of, of source of income so he could continue to go to school. <clears throat> and so uh, he, he did really well in school. By the time he was uh, 16 or 17, he was already ready to start going off to college. And that was more typical in those times. Um, but uh, he was going to go off to a school in Toulouse, which is about 100 miles away from there. Um, but again, they needed money, so he kept tutoring. Eventually, he was able to go off to college. Um, by the time he's about 19 or 20, he, uh, um, you know, they were he he had a very deep faith, and so they wanted to ordain him to the priesthood, but they couldn't because you had to be 24 years old to be able to do that. And so he kept studying. He went off to school some more, kept tutoring, kept earning enough money to be able to go to school. And so this was a really unusual thing because, again, either you had money and went to school or you didn't go to school. Okay, but to work and go to school at the same time was, was practically unheard of. So anyway, so he, uh, he, he does get ordained at the age of 24. This is in, uh, so 81, this is in the early 1600s. So he gets ordained and... When a lot of priests got ordained at the time, they were kind of doing it for the wrong reasons. They would do this kind of for the money, kind of for the same reason they would get educated, right? So they could send money home to the families. But 
but there were a lot of priests that were kind of, you know, that was their primary goal. It wasn't necessarily all about God. It wasn't that they were necessarily all bad, but they were, their, their motives weren't entirely uh, pure. But Vincent, he was, he was different. He just had a real deep love of God. And, and, and rather than the big, you know, fanfare of the first mass that they would have for a lot of these young priests, he was like, no, nah. he says, I don't want that. And so he knew of this little chapel out in the middle of the woods, and he took two people with him, an acolyte and a server, and they went out to the woods and they had his first mass. And they said that he had his first mass in fear and trembling because he understood the gravity of what he was doing. And so he was just, he was just so humbled by what was going on. And so, um, so, so he, uh, he winds up being able to, get, uh, to be a priest and he's getting ready to start uh, his first assignment. And what happens is, is um, in order to do that, you know, he needed to get some money to be able to travel um, to, to different places. And so what happened was, is there was a woman in one of these areas who wound up leaving him uh, in her will, leaving him some money. Um, also, um, as part of that, there was a guy that owed her like four to 500 crowns. I don't know what a crown is or what it was worth in those times, but it was a fairly significant amount of money. And uh, this guy's like, hey, the woman died, you know, poof, I'm out of here. And he gets off to Marseille, which is on the other side of France. And Vincent's like, you know, not so fast. You know, because Vincent, doesn't, he's not like going after the money to get the money. He knows that he needs this because he wants to be able to do some good works with it. And so he goes off to Marseille with a friend of his. They find the guy and basically negotiates so that he gets about 300 crowns back. Um, so he's going to, he's got his small fortune that he's able to, to be able to start to, you know, to buy his vestments and do the different things he needs to do. So his friend says, okay, well, rather than, and again, this is, so now they're on the Mediterranean Sea over in Marseille. They got to get back over to the other side of France. So his friend says, well, rather than, you know, go across land, which takes a lot more time, it's more expensive, let's take part of it by sea, and then we'll cut across where we need to. <clears throat> Vincent said, okay, it sounds good to me. We can save some money. One of the things going on at this time was that there were pirates along the Mediterranean, and they were Turkish pirates, Muslim pirates, and they were basically just, you know, taking what they could get. And the time that this happened was there was this big festival going on. So there was a lot of, you know, maritime traffic, and there were a lot of people that had sold goods, they had um, bought goods, there was a lot of money that had exchanged hands, and so these pirates around there were just raiding all these ships. All of a sudden they realized there's three ships behind them, and they're closing fast, and there's no way they can get away from them. Eventually, they're boarded. There's a big, big battle ensues, and uh, all but about Vincent and two or three other people are killed in the battle. <clears throat> and the uh, the the, um, the pirates took so many casualties. The captain was so angry when he got on board. And once he finally took over, they he he uh, killed the captain and he hacked his body to bits. He was just so angry, just in a fit of rage. And so what they did with the survivors, and then they had, they had a few other incidents along the way. They took all the survivors, they were going to sell them into slavery. And so what they did is they sailed for North Africa. And so you guys know the Mediterranean Sea at the northern part. You've got, you know, Spain and France and Italy over here. On the southern part, you've got like Algeria and Tunis and Egypt and all that down here. Well, they set sail for Tunis because this is a big marketplace. in an area called the Barbary Coast. It was a really wild wild area. So um, they take the prisoners there and they sell them into slavery. And so the first person to buy Vincent is a fisherman. Well, as soon as he takes Vincent out onto the ocean, he realizes Vincent gets seasick. So he's like, I got a bad deal. He sells him. Um, next guy that gets him, um, you know, it was, uh, he was a little bit better off, but the guy winds up dying. And his nephew didn't want the slave anymore, so he sold him again. And he sold him so this is like in 1605, all this is going on. He sells him, and um, the, the guy that buys him is actually a Frenchman who is an apostate. So he had, when he was captured, um, what they basically said is, if, if you denounce your religion, we'll let you live as one of us. And that's what they were offering to Vincent and all these other people too. Vincent said, no way. So he's a slave. So this other guy said, okay, yeah, fine. Yeah, I don't want to be a slave. So he apostas apostatizes the Catholic faith, becomes Muslim. And so he's living high in the hog. He's got three wives. He's just, he's got all this land. You know, he's living the good life. And he winds up uh, with Vincent as a slave. So one day after a couple months of being there, 
one of the wives is out in the fields and she hears this singing and um, she goes to where the source of singing is and it's Vincent and he's singing Catholic hymns and he's singing the Regina Celli and she just sits there and listens to him. She's Muslim and she listens to him and she's just brought to tears. And she says, you know, sing some more, sing some more songs. And so he does. And after a time she goes back home and she goes to her husband and she goes, why would you ever leave a religion that has such beauty to it? You know, she's a Muslim, right? And we know, you know, with, with the Muslim faith, we know that, you know, basically they're, they're going to kill you if you're not, if you don't want to stay Muslim. So, but she's, so this takes guts on her part, but she's like, why would you ever leave? <clears throat> and he had been there a while, but he, he, it, this start, this question started to really gnaw at him. And eventually he realized, man, I really made a big mistake here. I, this is, I, I, I'm really, I really done a, a bad thing. And so he goes to Vincent and he says, he says, um, I've realized that what I've done is wrong. And, um, you know, Vincent's a priest. I don't know if Vincent absolves him or anything like that, if, if Vincent is, is, is hearing confessions or not. But anyway, he says, there'll come a time when we can escape and I'll take you with me. So about nine months later, um, the time comes and they get a little boat somehow. I don't know if they stole it or they acquired it or whatever, but they just take this little boat and they go across the Mediterranean Sea, which is not, you know, this is not a, a little adventure that they set off on, and they make it back over to France. And this caught the attention of people over in France, including one of the cardinals um, from Rome, who was there at the time. And he wanted to hear their whole story. Uh, and so basically the man who uh, had apostatized, he comes back to the church, he's forgiven, um, and Vincent is taken to Rome and eventually winds up back in Paris in front of the King of France telling his story. So he gets some notoriety without even really doing anything other than just escaping from slavery. So anyway, so Vincent winds up, uh, so he's back, he's, he's free again, he's kind of back on his track to becoming a priest. Well, he meets this one uh, priest, his name was Father de Barul, and it's French, so I'm butchering the pronunciation of it. Um, but uh, this man actually eventually wanted to be becoming a cardinal. And I think he's actually either venerable, venerable or blessed at this point in time. But uh, this man had started this thing called the Congregation of um, the Oratory. And so he was kind of getting, you know, kind of not acquiring priests, but he was attracting priests to this, and Vincent was attracted to this. So they didn't have a, um, a place yet, you know, like kind of a monastery. So um, Father de Barul arranged for Vincent to stay somewhere. And it was with another gentleman who was a judge from his, his home region. And so he thought, well, this will work out well. They'll speak the same language, you know, the same dialect. I'll have a, I'll have a good time. Um, and so things went well for a while. <clears throat> then shortly thereafter, Vincent got sick. And so um, the judge sent for someone to bring some medicine, and then the judge went out for the day. Um, well, the, the delivery boy comes uh, to deliver the medicine, and he goes to the cupboard to get a glass so he could, you know, hear some water, take the medicine. Well, in the cupboard, he sees this purse of money, and it's the purse of money up from the judge. So the delivery boy, you know, seeing that, you know, hey, there's this fortune sitting there, takes the purse, gives Vincent his medicine, and leaves. Well, the judge comes back, and he sees his money's gone, and um, says, you know, Vincent, why'd you take my money? Vincent goes, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't know there was any money there. I didn't do anything. And, and uh, he starts really berating him, and Vincent says, look, God knows the truth. I didn't do this. Well, this guy wasn't going to take no for an answer, so he goes out in the streets, and he calls for the police to come in. Police are like, you know, there's no proof that he did this. Um, he goes to this Father David Rule, and he says, you know, Vincent took my money, and Father's like, yeah, I know Vincent. You know, I've known him for a while. He, he wouldn't do that type of thing. So nobody was believing the judge. Well, eventually this judge, he just goes out and just trashes Vincent in front of everybody, um, just trying to tear him down. He's just convinced that Vincent did this. About six months later, this delivery boy is on his deathbed, and he confesses the whole thing. And he says, I want to make amends to the person I stole the money from. Well, as soon as the judge hears this, he's just, he's all about forgiveness um, from Vincent. He's like, I'll do whatever it takes. Just forgive me. I'll even beg on my knees. And Vincent's like, look, you know, you're forgiven. I, I've, you know, there's nothing you need to do. Just 
you know, forget the whole thing ever happened. I mean, because he was just so humble. He wasn't interested in, you know, paying me back or vengeance or restore my reputation. He's just like, you know, whatever. Um, and so um, by this time, uh, he was ready for his first assignment. He was getting ready to go. And Father David Rule had heard from a count and a countess, Count de Gandhi. Um, they were up near Paris. And so at this time, there was, you were either really rich or you were really poor. There was very little in between. And the counts and the countesses, so when you see these um, pictures of people from this time and they got all the frilly things and the big puffy sleeves and the big dresses and the hair, that's who these people were. They were very rich. <clears throat> and so, um, so he goes to become the priest in their court, which was common. The counts and the countesses would typically have a priest who would be kind of their advisor we'd say their uh, personal masses and that type of thing. And so he goes there and, um, you know, right off the bat, the count and the countess, they were pretty good Catholics. I mean, they weren't, you know, they weren't stellar because they were rich and so they were very worldly. Um, but they, they, they wanted to be better. <clears throat> and so, um, especially the countess, she could really see that there was a, there was a holiness about Vincent, Father Vincent. And, um, and so she, she would just listen to him talk and the way he talked about the poor and wanting to serve the sick and the, the you know, the orphans, it just really captivated her. She wanted to, to hear more about this. And so um, there was a time when they went off to their summer house. And um, so at the time there were, you know, there were, there were servants and then there were the peasants that would work the fields. Well, there was this one peasant who was one of the head workers and he fell ill and so she sent father vincent to him father vincent goes to him and is, is talking with him and says you know i really i really feel like you should make a general confession and the guy was a pretty good catholic but um he just really encouraged him to kind of go through the events of his life and just make a general confession so that um if there was any sins he had forgotten he would be forgiven of them and um he does this and he is just like floored by this. I mean, he goes to the countess and he says, he says, I'm so grateful to you because if you wouldn't have, if you wouldn't have had me do this and had sent Father Vincent to me, I would have died in mortal sin and I would have, I would have been damned to hell. And this is, this is tremendous. Thank you so much. And the countess is just taken aback by this. And she says, Father, you should preach on this at mass on Sunday about, you know, kind of this idea of, of, you know, of confession, you know, something that we should all be doing anyway so he does and later that afternoon it was said the confession lines were so long that they had to get more priests in just to hear all the confessions that his his oration on confession was just so heart-wrenching that people just wanted to rush to confession at that point in time so um so anyway so the other reason that he was sent to the count of the countess was primarily to be a tutor to their two little sons Two little sons were terrible. In fact, everyone nicknamed them the two little demons. Um, they were just so awful. And they wouldn't listen, they wouldn't do lots of stuff, kind of like a few of our middle schoolers at times. Um, and so um, they just wouldn't listen, they just wouldn't get it. And you know, even though the Count and the Countess were, um, they were totally enthralled with um, everything he was saying, everything he was doing, these two kids, they just were not getting it. There was nothing he could say or do would make them behave, would make them learn, would make them listen, make them do anything. And so, you know, he just, you know, this was kind of frustrating Vincent a little bit. And after a few years, he kind of felt like, okay, this isn't where I'm supposed to be because I'm not having any effect on these kids at all. Even though he was having a great effect on uh, the count and the countess and their court and the people in the area, um, he just, it just didn't seem like this is where he should be. And so he talked to this, sent him word to this Father David Rule, and uh, he got him an assignment at uh, a little parish um, kind of near there. I always want to get there. It's uh, at the Châtillon. It's, you know, another French word I'm butchering. Um, but uh, so it's just this little, little town, a lot of poor people there. In fact, when he gets there, you know, the church is just in shambles. There's like, there hasn't been a mass there in 10 years. Even though there's some priests in town, it's just, there's just not... It's just not, nothing's going on. People are just destitute. There are, so, there are a couple rich people in the town, 
but they're so afraid to go outside because of the poor people. They're just, there's, it's just a very dysfunctional area. So anyway, so he, he winds up starting to get people, you know, going back to mass and refurbishing the church and, um, and, and, you know, starts to turn things around for people. They start to listen to it because they've just never heard anybody speak with, um, the conviction that he has, right? They've, they've had priests there before, but nobody that's really kind of challenged them to be better than they were. And so, um, I just want to take a look here at my notes. Um, and so while he's there, there's this one guy, he's called the Count de Rougemont, um, and he's kind of like this, this pretty worldly guy. And he, he's like, well, you know, I'm going to check this guy out. You know, if anybody can make him unholy, it's me. You know, and so he goes there and he sees Vincent. Vincent sees him and the guy just crumbles. He just gets down on his knees. He's like, Father, forgive me, I'm a sinner. You know, Vincent doesn't even say anything. Right? And this guy just falls to his knees. He realizes he's in the presence of holiness. And, and he's just like, you know, whatever. It's, it's almost like... Um, the story of Zacchaeus, right? Okay, if I've if I've if I've fault uh, defrauded anybody of money, you know, I'll give it back, you know, and I'll pay it back four times what I owe. And he does, and he just totally converts on the spot, and he starts selling off all of his property and all of his lands. Well, there's this one property um, that he has; it's an estate, and he, if it wouldn't be for Vincent telling him not to, he would have sold that off too. And he says, "Why don't you want me to sell that off?" And he says, "Well." He says, this is a perfect place for us to turn into like a hospital and a hospice and a place for poor people so we can serve them soup and bread and, and bring people here and care for their needs. And so they do. And so this count, he totally becomes like one of the servants and he just, he just serves right along with everybody else. And a couple of years later, he winds up dying, but he dies like totally repentant and just died a very holy death. And all of this because of being in the presence of Vincent, uh, Father Vincent. Um, and so during this time, um, before mass one day, um, these poor people come up and they're outside the church. And one of the people says, father, you know, you should tell people that, you know, of course there's poor people everywhere, but father, you should mention something about this in mass. You know, maybe we can do something for some of these poor people because he'd been starting to have this effect on people. And so he does. He says something in Mass. And later that afternoon, there's a flood of people with all sorts of things to bring to the poor. And so Vincent you know, realizes, he says, you know, the problem isn't that there are no resources. The fact that this is, is that it just lacks organization of getting the resources to the people that need it. And so a couple of the, the women in the area had started to hear him talk about this. And they were, again, kind of like the Countess had been just kind of falling in love with this idea of serving the poor. To them, it was kind of this quaint little idea, you know, and they were kind of like, oh, this, this seems like something to do. And so they started, you know, talking about wanting to do this. And they do. They start serving the poor. And they start, keep in mind, these people are not used to working with their hands. But they're getting down there and they're working with the poor. They're serving soup and bread and, and getting there and working with the poor people. And they're enjoying it. And they're having fun. There was even a point where, where there was, uh, um, you know, just, there were so many people that were helping out that this started to spread. It started to go to other areas of France as well. So during this time, the Count and the Countess kind of were realizing, you know, how much, they, you know, they had tried a couple other people to help them out, a couple other priests, and it just wasn't working out. And so the Countess implored this Father de Berule to bring Father Vincent back. And so, um, so he does. He, he, he asked Father Vincent to go back, and out of obedience, Father Vincent does. And he it said that, you know, he was not, you know, so far... Uh, beyond saying that, well, perhaps I was wrong, perhaps I should go back. His trepidation of going back was basically, though, that, well, who's going to take care of this? And he said, well, you've now started this, and it will keep going. And so now you need to go on to your next assignment. And so he does. Um, so while he, uh, so he goes back, and he's back with the Count and the Countess. So he's, again, he's living in this big palace kind of thing. And um, one of the responsibilities of the Count is that he's also in charge of the Navy. Now, at this time, again, this is the early 1600s, early to mid 1600s, there's only two ways ships got places. One was by sails with the wind, and the other one was by galley slaves. So you see sometimes those movies and it's got all those guys and they got the big oars and they're, they're doing this. Well, those were the criminals. 
and the revolutionaries and the prisoners that they captured at wartime and they turned them into galley slaves and basically they rode these big boats and there would be like 50 or 60 or 70 of these guys rowing the boats and it wasn't like they were just you know happily rowing the boats there was guards there and they were whipping them and they were you know they were you know they were making them do this and they weren't giving them breaks and they were being relentless to these guys and Vincent was sent to to be the chaplain to these people and he saw the conditions were just abhorrent they were just the worst he had ever seen and he went to see where they lived and they just lived in these dungeons and they were chained up in the dungeons and they weren't given adequate food and there were rats everywhere and they had sores all over their bodies and he's like he went he went to the count he had tears in his eyes and he said he says count don't you understand you're going to be responsible for these men when you face our lord in judgment and this floored the count he's like i didn't know I, I, there's this is how we've always done things these are our prisoners this is how we treat the prisoners and Vincent, father vince is like no you need to you need to stop you need to stop doing this another kind of aha moment that the count had at one time is he was into dueling and and father vincent heard he was going to be part of a duel right mostly with swords but every now and then it was with pistols but they were he was primarily into sword dueling and father vincent heard this and he said he said you know, I've been in prayer about this, and if you don't stop doing this, the Lord has told me that you're going to die an unrepentant death. So you need to stop doing this. And again, the count's like, I never heard this before. It's never dawned on me that this was wrong. And to us, that just seems common sense. But but he repents for me. He never does this. And he was getting ready to go be part of a duel. So for him to back out of a duel, that was huge for him to back out of that. You know, this was like a, that's like a, you know, it's a dishonorable thing to do, but he did it anyway because he realized that it was more important to be true to God than to, to be true to this, this oath he had made to be part of a duel. So uh, during this time when he was back there, Vincent was going through the town and um, as he was walking through the town one night, he saw this beggar and his beggar had this child and he was beating the child. <laughs> And he's like, what are you doing? And he takes the child away from him. And the beggar says, well, you know, this is what we do. We get a child and like a baby, we steal one or we buy one from an orphanage and we, we beat them up, make them look, you know, very ragged. And then we go out and we beg and people feel sorry for us because we've got this poor child and they give us more money. And he's like, what? He says, that's terrible. He's like, not in my watch. He takes the child. And so he's like, he's like, this is this is nuts that this is going on. And so then he goes to this orphanage to take the child there, and he finds the conditions there are worse. So like the the people running the orphanage, you know, they they've got a couple hundred kids, and they're like drugging them so they don't cry. These like babies, and they're not giving them enough food, and they're in just squalor of conditions. And they would like sell them the babies to people for like one franc. And a lot of times it'd be these beggars who get a franc, they buy a baby, beat it up, and then go out and, and try and make more money. And this was what was going on. And he's like, no, not on my watch. This is not going to happen. So he, he finds out that um, he goes and he takes a couple of the kids from there. And he goes to um, a lot of these women that were working for him. And they had started to, to get quite a following of people going. They had servants. They had the ladies of the town who had a lot of means by which to do things. Um, and at first they were kind of like, you know, I mean, you know, we're, we're spread kind of thin. And he's like, look, these are children, you know, they, we, we need to do this. And eventually they kind of go, yeah, okay, we do need to do this. And they set up this area, this building called the Foundling Hospital. And the Foundlings were these little children that they found. And they bring, they wind up with two or 300 of them there. And um, um, this really turns out to be a real source of inspiration for Vincent. There's a point where um, I want to read something because of what it says, what he said about it. Um, you know, if you're doing this much, this many good works, and you're seeing the kind of conditions that he's seeing day in and day out, that starts to wear on you. And so this is what um, this is what was written about him. It says he came across much that was neither innocent nor attractive in his dealings with the world. He was one who never judged harshly and who could always see in man, however depraved, the image of his maker. Yet the innocence and purity of his own soul found their best solace in the company of these little creatures whom he had rescued from a double death. 
They were his recreation in the moments of depression, which all who work for the welfare of mankind must experience. And so this was a consolation to him as seeing what conditions these kids were in and you know, the, and what conditions there was, there was people leaving babies on the steps of churches and they would just freeze to death at night. And it's just, it, the, the poverty was just intense everywhere. And so they were just trying to rescue as many children as they can, they could at that point in time. And so what they did is they, they the whole, this whole thing was what they had done is they had started this group called the, uh, the Daughters of Charity, or excuse me, the Ladies of Charity. And this is what, what their, and again, keep in mind, the first ladies of charity were these very rich people who were not used to dealing with their hands. And it said the association was to be under the management of the curé of the parish, which is like the pastor, and every good woman might belong to it. Its members were to devote themselves to the service of the poor for the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, their patron. They were to tend the sick cheerfully and kindly as they would their own children, not disdaining to minister to them with their own hands. And so this was this is what they lived by. And so eventually there were some nuns that became part of this, and they were the sisters of charity, and um, they wore this gray habit, and they would call them the gray sisters. And so they would go around doing good works, and they would help the sick, and they would bring them um, to this place called uh, uh, Saint Lazar, which is that that place that that um, estate that had been converted into a place for the um, for the for the poor. And they would bring them there and they would just, they would do as many good works as they could. And this was just, it just became second nature to them. There was one story that said that they sent out four of them one time to an area where there were some people that were suffering from a contagious disease. And four people were like, no, I'll, no, I'll go, you know. And they go and two of them wind up dying from the disease. And they get word back about that and four more people step and go, send me. Now think about that in light of what's going on now. Right? These people were like, no, I mean, I, I could very likely die from this thing, right? There's, there's a greater than 50, 60, 70% chance I could die. Send me. And now we're, we got like a 0.02% chance of dying and we're just terrified. Okay, just to give you a, give you a little perspective there on, on what these people were doing. They're like, no, I want to do this. And so this was, this was how much of an impact that, that Father Vincent had on these people. And he wasn't coercing them. They were volunteering to do this. And so, um, so, so this just, all these things just kept spreading around through France. Now, um, this was all, a lot of this was going on during a time period called the Thirty Years' War, which lasted from 1618 to 1648. And um, at first, most of the fighting was going on in Germany and other areas, maybe the border up by near Belgium in that area, but after after like 1635, 1638, the, the fighting was was spilling more into France itself. And so a lot of the resources of the country were going to this war. And so they wanted to send some of the Sisters of Charity up there, but they were pretty short of funds. Um, and, they, and they said, well, if we do that, we're gonna have to take some money from the Foundling Hospital and from some other projects. And Vince is like, we can't do that. We have to maintain this too. And so like, well, we can't do both. And he said, all right, well, let me, let me pray about this. And what came to him, and this was the, the, his whole thing was he had a very deep prayer life. This wasn't like he was just doing this. I mean, his, his whole life was based on prayer. And so all of a sudden he started printing up these leaflets, talking about what they were doing. And he would hand these out. Again, this isn't like now we, we run down to postal connections and here make 500 of these things, right? They had to, this, this took some doing. But he had these leaflets printed and then he went around and he distributed them and people saw what they were doing and people started donating money. And also more people started volunteering. And so suddenly they had enough people to do all these things. Um, but, this, but this all, you know, really kind of um, wound up you know, taking its toll on, you know, again, like we were talking about before, how, you know, anybody who does this work, this is hard work. And this really can kind of you know, tear at you. Um, and so this started to really um, wear on, on Vincent's health. Um, before we get to how he died, um, there was one other thing that's worth men mentioning, and it's how he dealt with a heresy called Jansenism. And during that time, you know, there's been multiple heresies throughout um, the history of the church that we've had to deal with. And this is one that was popular at the time. In fact, some of the people in his order 
had broken away to kind of be part of this heresy. And without getting into the whole thing about Jansenism, the two tenets that were really striking about Jansenism was one is that there was a whole thing about predestination. Basically, it said that there were only some people that Christ came to save and the rest of them weren't going to get saved no matter what they did, which basically means they can't respond to the grace that's given to them by God, which we know is not true. Everybody has grace that God gives them and they are free to respond to it. So we know that that's not true. The other thing that they that they proclaimed was, and, and the thing with heresies is that they usually start off with someone who's, you know, pretty pious and they know what they're talking about. But then one idea gets a little off track and suddenly the whole thing just goes in a whole other direction. And that's what Jansenism was doing. So one of the tenets that said that the sacraments, you know, took this took one of the tenets of the church that the sacraments are very holy. True. But they contested that the or yeah, they they yeah, contested that the um, the sacraments were so holy that nobody could approach them, not even the priests. They were just, they were just so, so, there was so much awe to them that we were not worthy to do it. And true, we really aren't. We don't, we don't, we, we can't merit heaven. We don't deserve all the good things that God gives us, but yet he wants to give them to us. And so he gives us the sacraments. And so that's the mistake they made is that, that God is giving us the sacraments so that we can come to him, not to wow us with his power. And so this was, this was a big a big sticking point. This was really rampant during this time. Well, Vincent realized this is basically talking against all the people we're serving, right? Because all these people that they're saying are poor, you're saying they're not going to be saved no matter what they do. And so he fought hard against this. And, you know, and, there were, and so he preached about it. And there were a lot of people who were like, they were starting to be convinced about it. And then they're like, well, Vincent says that it's not a good thing, so it must not be. So he was starting to make some inroads and in trying to fight this heresy during the time. But again, it was like the guy was just under constant, there was always something that he was dealing with. And he, but the funny thing about Vincent is he always said that I'm not doing as much as I should be doing. You know, it was just this constant, you know, some people say, well, that's false humility, and it wasn't. He just really felt like, there's more he could be doing. And so there, all these things just started happening. He just abandoned himself to the to the things that, that were presented to him and, and he felt it was his task to do something about them. Well, like I said, he, he did wind up getting pretty ill in his last years. He died in 1660. So he lived to be about 79 years old. You know, and we, have, we know a lot of people, we all know a lot of people who are 79 years old and they got plenty of life left in them. But again, in the 1600s, not a lot of people are living this late in life um, because there are there's so much disease, and there's so much poverty, and there's there's so many things that are that are kind of cutting their lifespan short. But he led a super full life. I mean, he did every. It's like he's all wrapped up into one. He's like what Christ calls all of us to do in doing the corporal works of mercy. All you know, you know, feeding the naked, uh, or feed, excuse me, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. You know, all those things. Um, you know, the, uh, he he did all that. And, and so he's a great example of that. Um, now, the St. Vincent de Paul Society um, didn't come around for another couple hundred years. And um, he had been uh, beatified and canonized in like 1720s and 1730s. So he had been a saint for a good hundred years. Well, in France, there was a gentleman by the name of Frederick Ozanam. And he was at college, he was about 20 years old. And there were a lot of uh, his friends and intellectuals, they get together and had these discussions. He was a Catholic and there were some Catholics and there were some non-Catholics and they were having this debate one night and uh, and the people who were the non-Catholics were saying, you know, yeah, you're right. I mean, people like St. Vincent de Paul, they did some awesome stuff, but what has the faith done lately? And this really, it's really kind of convicted Frederick. Um, again, this is in 1833 in France. This is, you know what? 30 years after, 40 years after the French Revolution, you know, Catholicism trying to rebuild itself. And he's like, you're right. And so he and some others started this thing that eventually became known as the St. Vincent de Paul Society. They started serving the poorest of the poor and, and doing all these corporal works of mercy that um, that St. Vincent was doing. And so this thing just grew like crazy to become what it is today, 
which is a great service organization um, that provides a lot of things. And I think sometimes we think, well, St. Vincent de Paul Society, you know, I took my, I took some clothes and some old dishes and I dropped them off at St. Vinny's and they have some money that they earn from it and they do their ministry work. But, you know, I didn't have a clear picture on all the things that they do until just maybe about a year ago. And of course, you know, we just had the, the clothing drive that we all participated in and, you know, we, I don't remember what we donated, 300 items of winter clothing, which is awesome, you know, to be able to give to people who can't afford it. But I had a friend, um, it was before Christmas 2020, and, um, you know, you guys know I work a few hours a week over at Quick Trip, and this guy started working there, he was gonna become assistant store lead. He's a pretty big dude. Um, and he was having some problems with his knees and um, he injured his knees and he couldn't work anymore. He's only like 28 years old. Um, but he had a wife at home and two kids and because of COVID, she was teaching the kids out of their apartment. And so he was their primary source of income. Well, he couldn't work and his disability wasn't gonna kick in for another couple of months. And during the meantime, um, you know, his landlord said, we're kicking you out. And he's like, he came to me because he said, you know, Steve, I always felt like I could talk to you about stuff. And we were having some discussions, you know, about him wanting to get reconnected with the church. You know, he's born Catholic, but had been away. He kind of had a little bit of a reversion in around 18, but just in the last six months was really feeling a heart tug to come back to the church. So I said, well, let me see what I can find out. And so we called St. Vincent de Paul and they said, yeah, give us his information. And what they did is they supplemented his rent until his disability kicked in and they didn't lose their apartment. And so that's, that's the spirit of what St. Vincent de Paul did. You know, it didn't matter. It didn't matter if you were rich, poor, it didn't matter if you were Catholic or non-Catholic, what you were, they were gonna help you. That's what he was gonna do. And that's what the society truly does live that out. And so I would encourage you to, um, you know, uh, to, to become involved in that, you know, that type of thing, because um, there's a lot of a lot of great things to go along with it. Do you guys have any questions? Claire? Not in the reading I had. I don't know that, you know, I think there, I think actually it turns out they had a third son that became a priest. I seem to remember something there. I don't know if the other two ever actually became demons or... <laughs> what it was, um, they, they were just terrible. You know, they just wouldn't listen. You know, and part of that is, you know, when you're, when you're born, not everybody, but sometimes when you're born in a privilege, you know, that's the attitude you have. And that's kind of how these kids were. So it didn't say what actually became, not, nothing I was reading in this book, which is a really good book. Um, nothing in there said what became of those two kids. But I do seem to remember a footnote that said there was a third child that came along later that did want to become a priest. Don't quote me on that. Any other questions? Claire again. Um, Claire for 400. <laughs> no, because she lived, she lived, um, she was in the 1800s, 1800s into the 1900s. <coughs> Excuse me, yeah, but she, but she very much, um, very much lived out his. I'm trying to remember if, if she was inspired by the St. Vincent de Paul Society. It wouldn't surprise me if there was some connection there. I'd have to go back and check. But she, it wouldn't surprise me if she was inspired by his works because she very much lived that out. She would have been the type of person who would have been one of the, the ladies of charity, you know, who had plenty of money, um, but then just wanted to do nothing but do good things with it. So a quick reflection on um, the resurrection of the Lord with the grace of the mystery being faith. 
St. Vincent de Paul was a man of great faith. Um, there's very few that could have accomplished what he accomplished without faith. Um, and again, part of this was, and we talked about this with a few states, sometimes the air of holiness around somebody kind of inspires people to do things. Remember that one count who kind of fell at his knees? You know, he, was, he walked up to me, he was going to basically tell him off, and suddenly this guy just crumbles and his whole life converts as a spot. And, you know, people could, people would say that about like Mother Teresa and John Paul II. They would, they would just see these people and they would just start weeping, you know, because there was just something about them that um, they knew they were in the presence of a holy person. And so that doesn't just happen. All those people who have that about them have a great faith. You know, they believe in the resurrection of Christ. And this idea of the resurrection, and we talked about this before, I think, is that, you know, the resurrection is even more important than Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Because, yes, Jesus could die on the cross for our sins and pay that debt. But if he doesn't rise from the dead, then it isn't proof that he did what he did. He doesn't actually conquer death. He doesn't actually do it. So he has to rise from the dead. He does it by his own power and rises from the dead. And so that takes great faith to believe that that is true. And that's one of the big sticking points with a lot of people. They can't believe that that part of, our, of the faith is true. And so that's what we have to hold on to, that idea of the resurrection, that Jesus actually did what he said he was going to do. He predicted that. He predicted that he was going to do this, and then he did it. And so he, he proves he is who he says he is. And so Vincent believed that with all his heart. And he spent a lot of time in prayer and a lot of time asking God what he should be doing with his life. And he did. And God presented him with things and he always went to prayer with it. And there was times where he would go, you know, after something would happen. And, and I watched a movie on him too. And he did a nice job of this where he said, basically, someone who was poor would say something to him. And he would go to God and say, thank you, Lord, for teaching me what this person already knows, right? And it wasn't like this person was a great theologian. They would teach him something simple about life that he he needed to gain from them. And so, again, that was all part of his prayer life. So it's a really important trait that we all need to we all need to to uh, to grow. All right, so let's do our prayer for uh, prayer of Saint Gertrude for the holy souls. We'll pray these together. Eternal Father, I offer thee the most precious blood of thy divine Son, Jesus, in union with the masses said throughout the world today, for all the holy souls in purgatory, for sinners everywhere, for sinners in the universal church, those in my own home and within my family. Amen.